Hello, good morning. This is The Jay Show. This is Dr. Jay Smith with another doctor, Dr. Andy Bannister. Paradox. A paradox. That, that's right. Good to be with you, Jay. It's good to have you here, Andy. We've been wanting to have you on the show because not only because of your background, you're able to really talk extemporaneously on most any subject, but specifically, we want you here because of what you have done in Islam. Now, let's give some background first. Hmm. Where, uh, where did you get interested in Islam? So I got interested in Islam, actually. That was your fault. I don't know if you recall well, it. Well, take full credit for take that. Take full credit. So uh, the year was 1997, 20, uh, 20, 20, years, 20 ago. years ago. We all had more hair. And uh, in, in your case, more teeth um, back then. And now, uh, the you, teeth have been remained the same. It's the color of the hair that you didn't want to get changed. to. But go ahead. I so don't you, mind. Uh, 20 years ago, 1997, you came to the church I was attending in London, did a seminar on Islam and especially about the work you were doing at Speaker's Corner up there on the ladder, on yeah. Hyde Park Corner, reaching Muslims. Sounded amazing. I went and talked to you and said, uh, found out more about you, what you were doing. And uh, you said to me these immortal words, Jay. You said, "Come to Speaker's Corner next weekend." and see what we do. Observe what we do. I was yeah, you hearing this, viewers? Word. See what we do, is what he said. Um, I got to Speaker's Corner to meet Little you. Little did you know I had two ladders. With a spare ladder, and I think your exact words were, up you go, Andy, preaching on the street to Muslims, it's not hard. They were your exact And you're the words. only one I could really do that to. There are very few oh, people that boy. I could ever put up on the ladder the first And anyway, time. what I remember is the uh, it was packed crowd that day. I remember the Muslims there tore me to pieces. I remember getting down from the ladder thinking to myself, maybe I need to become a Muslim because they seem to have all of the answers. I have none. Went home, my head spinning and thought, you know what? I need to do some study. And I remember I started reading, I started studying, and it was through those speaker's corner experiences that I discovered apologetics. You know, that branch of Christian theology mm -hmm. concerned with giving reasons why the Christian faith is true. And I begin, began digging more deeply into Islam. And I found it so fascinating, I ended up with me doing a, a PhD. Here in London, didn't Here you? in London, yeah, looking at the origins of the Quran and how the Quran was put uh, together. So it and all you started. Did it, you did it under Dr. Peter Riddell. Dr. Peter Riddell, who. We uh, have the same supervisor. We absolutely do. And so Peter Riddell, for uh, people who don't know him, Peter Riddell is based at Melbourne School of Theology, theology yeah. down in Australia. And uh, anybody who's watching this happens to be a Christian and wants to study Islam. More details, great best place to go. you can get, Dr. Peter Best, Adele. one of the best. In the this world. is a plug we didn't intend to, but I'm sure he'll be happy. Uh, we can it. write to him and ask him to send us something. You can get stuffed a kangaroo or something. for it as yeah. well. Now back to so you <coughs> were interested in Islam, but I know uh, it, it's not just because of Speaker's Corner; it's because what's happening here in Britain and also what's happening around the world. There is an offensive against Christianity, is there not? I think so. I mean, in the sense of an offensive, in that I think Islam is very much uh, considers itself in some ways on a forward foot and, and pressurizing it on Christians, and at the same time, I think particularly here in the secular West, I think one of the things that intrigues me is that uh, you know Christianity often gets uh, in the neck from the popular press, from the popular media, but there's not the same critical scrutiny of, uh, of Islam. So you know, a, case, a, a topical case in point, just uh, what, a week, 10 days ago, one of our leading politicians here in the UK, Tim Farron, uh, resigned uh, his, uh, his liberal his democrat liberal yeah. democrat resigned in leadership of, of one of the, of the national parties here uh, because the press had pressed in on him and said do you think gay sex is a sin and as a christian he'd felt he had to sort of take the position he had and be forced to leave and i find myself remarking to friends i can't imagine somebody going to sadiq khan the mayor of london who's a muslim and saying mr khan do you believe that gay sex is a is a sin as a, as a muslim and so i think islam is often sort of gets this free pass in terms of criticism uh, that Christianity doesn't. And what interests me on the Quran, and we'll come to this, Jay, is the Bible, as you know, right, has been subjected to scrutiny over for the years. For, for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. And so, in, in, in a sense, biblical, I mean, historical criticism, redacted criticism, source criticism, all these criticisms have really uh, are created on the Bible, were they not? Absolutely. And the great thing is actually right from the very beginning, just to give you one you know, tiny, tiny example, almost from the beginning of Christianity, uh, you can find Christian scholars studying their texts, discussing you know, whether issues in the manuscript tradition and so forth. And that was done in the full light of, of history and scholars can So we've been co completely transparent. We've taken the yeah. criticism and we've gone and, back and, and found the answers. And run with it. Um, Islam, almost from the word go, there was an attempt to kind of critically engineer, critically control the text of the we Quran. We saw that with the Mutazilek controversy in the, in the 9th and 10th or century. Or you can go back to the third, to, to the Caliph, to Caliph Uthman and his burning of the manuscripts. Very manuscript. We talked, in fact, we'll be doing that and Hatun and I talked about that uh, volume six of Al Bukhari, so I think, 509, 510. Yeah. But certainly they have not had any critical analysis of looking and unpacking the Quran. 
No, it's tended to be held, uh, held at an arm's length. You don't ask the critical questions. And I think when I began moving into, into scholarship a little bit, that, in, that intrigued me. I found myself thinking there's a whole array of critical questions about the Koran that have not been, that haven't been asked. Can I just quickly g give me some ideas of what critical, what scholarship needs to be done? Before we get into your own yeah. specific area, what do you think it would need to be done yet? Well, a really good example of this, uh, a few years ago now, five or six years, years ago, I can't remember the exact date, uh, one of the uh, leading Quran, Western Quran scholars in the world, Fred Donner, Right. University of Chicago, uh, in an introductory article about the Quran, said there are a whole number of things that, that we take for granted in the study of other texts, such as the Bible, that we don't even have the beginnings of an answer to in Quranic studies. For example, you know, where did the text originate? Right. How was the Quran put together? How was it transmitted and by whom? How was it codified? How were the manuscripts then passed on? And he lists about three or four others. And is he, now, uh, right there, those questions, if a Muslim were to hear this, they would, it would go right over their heads. Because what do Muslims say? They would already have an answer to that. They would say, hold on, Mr. Uh, Dr. Donner, you don't understand. There is no question about the Quran. What are the claims they would make? No, exactly. So, for example, an orthodox uh, traditional Muslim would believe that the answer to where the Quran came from, it came like, quite literally from heaven, word for word, letter for letter. On the eternal tablets. On the eternal tablets. Uh, sure, 85 ayah 22. Brought down to Muhammad through the auspices of the angel Gabriel. So, Eternal, sent down. Exactly. So letter for letter. But not then. written during his lifetime. No, exactly. And then so Muhammad preaches the material in the Quran during the 23 years of his career, according to the Islamic so tradition. So when he died in 632, was it written down? It was not written down. And, why not? Uh, well, there's a number of uh, reasons uh, why not. Uh, I think one reason why not is I don't think Muhammad expected to die that quickly. I mean, that's a little bit controversial for another show. But I think, um, I think you can see that he, no preparations for his death were made. Look at the issue with the successors. There's this huge bust up in early Islam over who should lead the community after Muhammad's death. Okay, Why? so he no dies in 632, Abu Bakr then gets Abu Bakr then Zayd gets, ibn Thabit. That's right, so Abu Bakr uh, gets the idea to get uh, Muhammad's secretary, Zayd ibn Thabit. Oh, wait, wait. Secretary? What do secretaries do? Well, secretaries generally write and... and okay, so, so how, if he had been Muhammad's secretary, and this is the greatest revelation in the history of mankind. Well, exactly. You would have thought, right, that Zayd has What else is he doing? Well, I don't know. Counting, Writing letters? Counting the camels or something. But anyway, you would have thought, that's a very good point, you would have thought that Zaid would have spent his uh, time working with Muhammad as his amanuensis, his scribe, writing things down. But apparently not. The one thing that the man could have given credit for is while he was living and th <coughs> during that intervening, well, that, actually, it is 22 years. Yeah. All that time, why wasn't he writing everything? Well, it's, it, it's not just that, right, to go, um, let's imagine he was a slightly sort of a not-so-efficient secretary. He hadn't done the work himself, but he kind of knew who had. But that's not what happens when uh, Abu Bakr asks Zaid to collect the Quran. Do you remember? what he says, Jay? I think his exact words are, it would have been easier for to me to move, to move a mountain than to collect the Quran. And, and collect it from where? I mean, Well, then we read, he, the go, he wanders around, he collects bits from, from bones Bark. and scraps of parchment and all the, and then he says, <laughs> and people's memory. And I found the last verse that he collected in the, uh, from, I forget the name of the gentleman, but last, last verse in one person's We'll recitation. put this up on the screen because this is good. You need to see that this is not something Andy's making up. He's not creating this off the top of your head. You're actually referring to volume six, 509 and 510. We'll put it on the screen so you can see and it. And here's the thing. What, what's look at the Arabic yeah. and look at the English by side and by side. And that's important for, for Muslim listeners to, to do this because I remember actually I was at the University of, uh, of Alberta in Canada where I used to, used to live in Canada for, for six years. And I remember doing a, a lecture there, actually an academic lecture on the Koran. And in passing, I think it was actually during the q and A, I I mentioned that story I've just told you. Afterwards, these three Muslim students came to me, three fem fem female medical students. From memory, I think they were Egyptian. And they came up to me and their opening line was, how dare you say what you said? That's not true. And I said, well, have you read the Hadith? There you go. It was interesting. They hadn't. And I pulled out of my bag, uh, you know, on my, on my iPad, actually, so, you know, Sahih Bihari, showed them the text. And you could see this look of shock on their face. And I remember asking them this question. And if you're a, a Muslim listener to this, you consider yourself educated. Maybe you're a university student or professional. But the same challenge to you. Why do you not know this? I said to these ladies, I said, here you are at one of the best medical schools in Canada. You must be among the top 1% of minds here in this country. Why did you not know this? Okay. Silence, now, Andy, and then one of them said to me, I because hope nobody has ever told us. I hope you're all listening to what Andy's saying. Those of you who are Muslim, those of you who also want to work with Muslims, what Andy is doing, he's doing two things. He's asking the Muslims why they don't know this material, why they haven't read this material, why is it we have to introduce it to him. But you're also doing a second thing. You're also 
saving your own goat, so to speak. You're actually saying, listen, I'm not going to do say anything that I cannot quote, I cannot source. Therefore, if you're going to call me a hate preacher for bringing this material up, if you're asking to ask, why is it, how is it I can't even come to these questions, I'm going to be going back to your sources. I'm going to be only using what I have read. And these are legitimate questions, but don't call me a hate preacher. Don't say this is Islamophobic, since if it is hate, if it sounds like hate, Read your own text. Well, so you're yeah. safeguarding yourself. I think that's well. important. And two things I'd, I'd want to I'd say there, Jay. I think there's a there's a big difference between scholarship and, and hate. To go, I, I would hope every human being wants to know the truth, the truth about history, the truth about science, the truth about geography. And so, in terms of how the Quran came to be, that's a purely historical question. It shouldn't be. A stress shouldn't be controversial. But then, second, just for Christians watching this, because I, this will be a mixed audience, I'm, I'm sure. I encourage Christians watching this: don't go to your Muslim friends and bang them around the head as if you're trying to, you know, score cheap points and, and beat your Muslim friend up. Ask good questions. And one of the most powerful apologetics that I know is simply to show somebody a problem in their tradition and say, "What do you do with this?" There you go. And that forces them to do the hard. Thinking. And I have friends who are now Christians who are, who are Muslims who said that they're, they're coming to discover the truth of who Christ was began when they first began to allow themselves to ask those difficult questions. If you're a Muslim watching this and you've got that niggling doubt at the back of your, your mind, you think, I've always wondered about that, but you've pushed it away. Courage, you don't push it away. Ask the difficult questions. We can as Christians. I believe Christians. We demand this up. of our own pastors. Absolutely. We demand this of our own scholars. Absolutely. Anybody that gets up in a pulpit on a Sunday morning and they start quoting uh, what Jesus said, we would want to know where they're referencing. And no that. one should be afraid of truth. We should have to. And no. that's why if we demand it of Christians, then we should also demand the same thing of Islam. I'm so glad you brought this point up because this is something that a lot of Muslims have not done. As these young men who came up to you and said, this is not true. I've never heard this before. It's because they have not even looked at their own material. All you're doing is helping them to go back to yeah. study it, and then to, then, then to come to conclusions, which all of you need to do. You need to come to conclusions at a time. Now, Andy and I are going to bring up some stuff that's going to be damaging through this series. We know that. But everything that Andy is going to be doing, and we're going to make sure that we do this, that we support it, that we source it, and we have, right. let you know where the sources are. We're going to be putting up uh, graphs. We're going to be putting up text. Uh, you'll be able to see the text. That's why we wanted to make sure that this Al-Buhari reference Volume 6, 509 and 510 is something they can go to. Okay, let's then continue on. So he, um, he comes to, he dies, Abu Bakr then has his secretary write the first recension, the first copy. That's right. And then when you read that, that copy is lodged for safekeeping. Now, with Hafsa, one of with, the wives. With Hafsa. Then, then the things, now things get a little bit interesting. Now we shift on. We jump from Abu Bakr, Caliph number one. We jump to where things get really significant now is Caliph number three. Uthman. Uthman. So remember the story, remember what we just said. There's already a, an authoritative version of the Quran, theoretically, on Hafsa's shelf, safekeeping. I don't know, filing cabinet, safe, somewhere. Some say it was under her bed. Under her bed, wherever wherever she put it. Anyway, now we read, again in Sahih Bah Sahih Bah Bahari, we'll have this up on the on the screen behind, we trust that the technology works. Um, we read the, in, in the Hadith that uh, Soldiers, um, a general, uh, Hudhaifa from the battlefield, right, comes to um, Uthman and tells him that soldiers up on the battlefields, up in Syria, where the Islamic armies are expanding, the empire is growing, are beginning to fight amongst themselves, squabble among themselves over the Quran, what the Quran says. And he says, I think the exact quotation is the words to the effect of, O oh, chief of the believers, save this people before they differ about their scripture like the, like the Jews and Christians <laughs> did. That's another discussion. <laughs> There's the first polemic that's already introduced. Now, what does Uthman do? Does he say, well, I'll tell you what, let's just bring out the Quran. We've got it under, under Hafsa's bed. We've got it in the filing cabinet. We've uploaded it to Wikipedia. Actually, no, not a bit too early. Um, what does he do? He calls in our old friend, Zaid ibn Tabit. Zaid ibn Tabit. And once again goes, my friend, you thought you could rest up your camel spurs, but nope, you're off again. You've got to go and collect the Quran again. Does Zaid go, but oh, oh, chief of the believers, I did this, but, you know, a few years ago. No, off he trots again. And round he goes again and collects together all the different pieces of the Quran, including some manuscripts and, you know, fragmentary written parchments and so on and so forth, brings them all to Uthman. Along with three others. Along with three others. And he has one, or they have one authoritative version made and then four copies. No, you're wrong on that. I'm it's wrong on that. How many copies is it? Nine now. Nine copies now. Okay. Every right. province. We now know where the provinces okay, are. Okay, well, there we go. I always thought it was Basra, four, but Basra, Bagra, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden. Herat and Nishapur. Has so now we've got to find nine, nine copies. Makes his copies, has them sent out to those provinces, but here is the problem, right? 
What does he do with the, what's left over? Does he keep it, put it in a museum? Does he preserve it carefully? Does he look after it going, these are the earliest chronic materials we have and one day, you know, critical scholars would love to get access to this. No, he does not. As you're listening to what Andy is saying, we are gonna put this up there, you can see it. Take a look and see what it says. This is, we're not making this up. He then does what, Andy? He burns them. Okay, now why would he you burn? He destroys them. Why would you burn well, manuscripts? There are a number of answers here. At the most generous, um, one might say, well, because they're no longer needed, because they've made this authoritative copy. That seems pretty tenuous, uh, quite frankly. I've had Muslims say to me, well, those were, those were, there were problems with those copies, but to go, well, hang on a minute, he's just made his master versions from these, so if there were problems in the manuscripts, they've been passed on. Whatever it is, the only conclusion I think scholars can come to is whatever Uthman saw in those texts was dangerous enough and was devastating enough, was problematic enough, the best thing to do was consign it to the flames. Whatever it was that Uthman was burning, this was the razm, the consonant text. Constant, which means it would change the meaning. It would change the meaning. Now, the other thing to stress here as well, you will sometimes hear Muslims uh, say this, that, uh, that even you know, those voweling marks don't change the difference. They do, actually. There are significant differences even just in the voweling. That's a discussion for perhaps another time. But well, we said this earlier. Uh, you, you may not know this, but um, Hatun and I did a whole series. In fact, the whole, the whole first series on the 26 Qurans. We looked at how the diacritical marks not only change the meaning, how the Dagar Aleph changes the meaning, but also how the vowelization changes the meaning. And exactly. as it changes the meaning, it changes the theology. So we went through that quite, uh, quite in depth. So if, the, if you go back to the first season, they can uh, see that. They can watch that. But the key point is what Oatman was burning. You know, third time we're stressing it, but it's hugely significant. As I say, when I shared that story with those Muslims there at the University of Alberta, you could see, what was interesting, I could see on their faces, they got the significance of this. So again, for Muslims watching this, we're going to have the, the scripts up on the screen, encourage you, read them, dig into them. They, they're, they're your own text. These are the Hadith, uh, okay. Bihari, the most authoritative Hadith collection. And uh, this has always been a problem because Muslims have always claimed that it was complete by the time of uh, when Muhammad died in 632, was first put together at the time of Abu Bakr, 632, 634. By the time after Umar, then comes Uthman. By the time of, he, he, he's, he's in power from 646 to 656. So roughly 650 to 652 is what we're talking about. This is the time period when they finally had to put that final canonical form. So this is what we have here. This is what, this Arabic, portion here is what they're talking about. This is Uthmanic. Problem is, when was this written? This particular edition you're looking at here, I don't know which edition this is. is it well, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the Hafs. This would be the Hafs. Right. So this is now standardized right around the world. But when do you, when do you think, or when do you know, because you do know the date, when this was finalized? I'm, I'm terrible at dates, Jay, so I'm going to let you do 1924. the date. 1924. 1924. So I had the date right the first time. I did say 1924. Good man. 1924. 1924. And what exactly happened in 1924? Who are we talking about? This is a, a committee. They got That's together, right. Al Azhar University, they're in Cairo, and they put together this text that we have here. So they, not the, of course, not the English, but, and nor the commentary in the bottom. This text here. Now, this has been standardized primarily. We thought that this was standardized in every Quran all around the world, as we have seen and with indeed, Hatun. It is not. It is not. We can come up with 26 different uh, variations on this, uh, over 45,000 of words and phrases that are different than this Huff's text. And that's 45,000 so far. I mean, my suspicion is, as you and Hartu... We may be double this. I think you're going to... We may be double that's this. That's going to grow. We, we're going to grow and grow. And we're going to find other Qurans. We now think there may be as many as 37 out there. We've only come across 26. But this is the Huff's Quran. It's been around for about 93 years. Uh, as I said to Shabir Ali in our debate, Prince Philip is older than your Quran. And he did not like that. I meant, I did it. He, I said, he, I thought, he thought I was doing it tongue-in-cheek. I said, no, I actually mean it. The Quran you've got today is, is less than 100 years less old. Less than 100 years old. That means that we've got to go back and if that's all you can give us, then we've got to go back and find out where the manuscripts are that support that. We've got to go back and find out the yep, context. That's right. Now that's so. There's a number of areas. Let's just kind of name them off. Let's try to go through the number of areas of investigation we need to do. One is manuscript evidence. So there's there's manuscript evidence, and that's and unpack uh, that a bit. What, why so is that important? Well, as you've just highlighted there, so to go the Hafs Quran, 1924. So the question we would now need to be asking is: Is the Arabic text of the Hafs Quran is it supported by the manuscripts? Because between 1924 and uh, well, certainly between 632 A.D. when Muhammad dies in 1924, you can do the maths. Now, for those of you who are listening to this, this may not seem important to you because maybe you've never thought about manuscript evidence. Those of us who are Christians, this is hugely important because this has been a, an entire 
area of study in Christian biblical criticism. It's been a whole area of study. The other, the other reason I think some Muslims don't think it's important is I think I've come across Muslims trying to sort of say, well, the manuscripts are irrelevant because we have the oral transmission. And we memorize Of the kind we memorize. But of course, the problem is there, you can very quickly show that deconstructs. If you have Muslim number one and Muslim number two, and they recite the Quran, and they're both, and they disagree. Okay, where, how, how do you know they disagree? Well, let's, let's imagine, you ask your, you ask your, your Muslim friend to, to recite Surah 9, verse uh, 10, and they recite Surah 9, verse 10, and you say to them... According to what? Well, first according to what, but even... According to me? Well, hang on a minute, let me just finish the thought experiment for a moment. And then, you, and then you have another Muslim over here who recites the same Surah and Ayah, and it differs. How are you going to solve it? The okay. answer is, you're going to open this, this thing. So there has to so be a written the, text. There has to be a written text. There has to be a standard. And in fact, here's the interesting thing, and we may come to this later. In oral traditional studies, which is my, my own PhD area of expertise, and we'll come to this in more detail, one of the things that we've shown in culture after culture after culture, the idea of an exact original is an idea from literary culture. Oral tradition is, by its nature, fluid. And, uh, and so when we begin discovering this fluidity at the beginning of early Islam, in one sense, it's not a surprise. What I think has happened in Islam is that uh, Islam has later got hold of the idea of literary perfection and projected it back. And that's why they're struggling. It's not there. Think of our old friends. You can project it, but you've got to show something to prove think of our it, old friends. It. Think of our old friend Zayd ibn Tabit. You asked a very good question. Why did he not record it? I don't think it ever occurred to him. I don't think it ever occurred to him, I should be writing this down. This is just one man's preaching, and then suddenly there's this great campaign to get this written down. Hence why he says it's like moving a mountain. Well, it never even occurred to me that you'd have the idea Andy, of writing this down. this is down. done in every piece of literature. We talk about Shakespeare's plays and sonnets. Exactly. But once you have a, yeah, once you have a, a, once you have a written tradition, we have to start asking the question, is but there it... There have been many of his plays. So they've gone back to the original text. It's not the same as the one we're using today. No, that's right. And, and that's why scholars produce what's called a, a critical edition. And it enables... In now, most define that right there. So a critical edition it. is what you do is you take, the, you take the manuscripts that you have and you compare them, you contrast them, you look at where the differences are. And by sifting them carefully and analyzing them carefully, in most cases, it enables scholars to be very confident that the text you have in front of you is, says what it should do, or if it doesn't say what you should do, you can correct it. So if, you're, if you've got a 1974 edition of you know, Shakespeare's plays and there's a new manuscript discovered and it refers to, you know, hear it in Macbeth, line, you know, page three, line 10, it should say Duncan rather than Hamlet, no problem, we can adapt it, we can footnote it. And it actually increases your confidence. And as I say, Christians have been doing critical studies of our manuscripts right from the beginning, which is why when you or I pick up our Bible, we can be completely confident that what we have there goes back to what those authors wrote. I and the be, reason why is because we've, they've been critical from the time we've of Wellhausen, the, the time we've of We've studied the manuscripts. In the 1800s. And if scribes have occasionally made a mistake, if scribe A has written a word wrong and scribe B and scribe C and D got the word right, we can correct. Yeah. In, so, so textual criticism is not something to be afraid of. In Islam, For Christians. In Islam, it went a different direction. It went a different direction. And uh, because I think, the, because there was this sort of paranoia about we have to get a perfect text. If Uthman had taken the decision to go, let's just publish his manuscripts, let's make them all available, it's going to be some hard work, but at least we've got the truth, it would have been very different. Instead, when he lit his first match or whatever he used uh, back then, probably not a Zippo lighter, you know, I think a trend was set that's run through Islam, whereas today, you know, you can meet Muslims who tell you the Quran is letter for letter, dot for dot the same, which isn't true, and when you show them there are differences, they panic. Now, Dr. Dan Brubaker will probably dis disagree with what you've just said there, because he's saying that this probably not, had nothing to do with Uthman. It looks like that this was this whole idea of a Quran probably comes from the time of Abdul Malik. And we're going to talk about that in another series that we're going to do after this Yeah, material. let me just say something there very quickly because, I know, because people may sort of skip through shows and, and watch them. In my own work on the Quran, what I've tried to do is give as much benefit of the doubt to the sources as I can. I'm very open to the idea that, uh, that Dan may be right and that actually the Quran idea comes from much later. But let's just treat the sources as they are. Treat them as they do, with the respect. Treat them almost I'm as if... I'm going to be your devil's advocate, yeah. if you don't mind, because I'm going to so. keep bringing it back and say, well, let's hold on. Sooner or later, we're going to have to come to some type of scenario. Yeah. And I would like to, before you leave uh, these set of talks, we do come to some type of scenario so we can help the, those out there to try to say, at least think that there are yeah. some real problems here, but there are some solutions also. So let's come back. That's one of them, manuscript evidence. So manuscript is number one. Okay, okay. So that's the first one. What's another one? What's another piece? Okay, of second huge one is, of course, how the contents of what is the Quran 
came together. So to talk to give you just one example, uh, what first got me interested in how the Quran came together was the question of the biblical material in the Quran. About 20% of the Quran, 20%, that's you know, every fifth verse, um, is biblical material. Stories that are found on the pages of the Old Testament and occasionally of the New Testament, but also stories found in Jewish and Christian apocryphal. Okay. And so these are Christian. stories like Cain and Abel and Surah 5. So we have Cain and Abel, we have the story of Joseph, Surah 12. Joseph, Surah 12. We have the 90 or so verses about Jesus across the Quran. Uh, we have stories of Abraham, Abraham and the sacrifice, for example. Then we have um, legendary material that we know was generated by the Jewish and Christian community. So, for example, the story of the sleepers in the cave. Seven sleepers, okay. So there's, there's the then story. we also have some historical, like Dual Karanayn. Yep, we have the story. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Uh, we have the story of Jesus bringing the clay birds uh, That's to life. That's interesting, okay. So and then my own work, and we may talk about this later. I mean, we're gonna get, not in this episode, but, sure. but sorry, what, I, this is, what you're getting at is, so there's there's an awful lot of bor borrowing, but you don't like that word. We're yeah. Talk about that and actually, let me give you the other one, one other story, Joe, that I think is hugely important because I think it gives us a window into what's going on, which will connect with the later show. Is the story of Iblis and Adam. So the story, that's the story where, if you remember the story in the Quran, that mm -hmm. Allah creates Adam, and He brings the angels in and says to the angels, "Bow down." To, in fact, uh, that's repeated Adam. quite a few times. Seven right? times. Seven times. Seven times that story is there in the Quran. And you're going to unpack that for us, right? Not, not right now, but let's still get yeah, back. Yeah. So here's the question: How does that material? end up in the Quran. Why is it so jumbled up, for example? Um, why is it the Quran seems to assume that its readers know this material? How did it how did it get there? And the idea that it purely dropped direct from heaven is incredibly problematic. I mean take that story of Iblis and Adam. It's a really interesting window into this. We know where that story comes from. It's a Jewish fairy tale. We can trace it in the Jewish literature. Then Christians around about the, two, uh, the sort of two, late 200s, they get hold of it and start retelling in a Christianized version. It has a quite a lively life before it comes to the Quran. And Muhammad first had the idea of preaching it as part of the Quranic revelation. How did it get there? Where did he get it from? How did it find its way into the Quran? That's a hugely critical question. Okay, and I don't want to get on that because we're almost out of time on this episode and this is this is where we're really going to get into Oh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun and that's why we want you here because there's no one better that understands it, has really unpacked it and also has come to conclusions on it. Let's just review what we've done yeah. so far. So, Andy, yourself, you were you wanted to go into angelotry at one time. Well, not quite. I think my originally I was going to go into New Testament studies, and uh, the and problem I, I took you aside and I kind of well, said Peter Adell at Melbourne School of Theology did as well because as he pointed out in in when you do doctoral work, he wants to do something original, and the New Testament material has been so coated over which by scholars, anybody then can build off of. Yeah, and the, the the exciting thing about Islamic studies, Quranic studies, is because there has not been this willingness in Islam traditionally to do the critical work. That means for scholars who are willing to do it, there's a huge, you know, playing field uh, to come and do some do some work in. Now, did Peter actually give you this topic, or did he suggest this topic? No, so, the, so my topic that we're going to talk a lot more about in the in the next episode. This is how it came about. Uh, for my at the end of my undergraduate studies in theology, uh, I, uh, the place I was studying, you had to write a long essay, ten thousand word thing. So I thought I would go and investigate something called the Arabic Gospel of the Infancy. And that's the kind of late fourth, early fifth century Syriac uh, document, Ar Arabic document that uh, many uh, scholars think lies behind some of the Quran. So that, that has the story of Jesus turning the clay birds into yeah. living birds, speaking in the cradle, these kind of things. And, but no one had actually done much critical work on that document. So I thought, oh, I'll go and study that. And as I studied that, it's through then I became convinced, and we're definitely going to talk about this in the next show, that I actually the Quran hasn't copied from that word for word, but there's oral influence through word of mouth. And you can see it very clearly, you can show it very methodically, and the Arabic Gospel of the Infancy and those two little stories, the clay birds and the speaking in the cradle, kind of cracked open a window to a much, much bigger issue. And I think now we have a very good model for how the Quran came together, why it uses the material it does, that explains a lot of its origins before okay. we get to manuscripts. For those of you who are watching, you can see we're now opening up a whole can of worms. This is going to be difficult for a lot of you Muslims. Uh, we are not assuming that the classical account is historical. We've already gone on beyond that, that to assume that there are some problems. We've talked about manuscript evidence. Uh, we've talked about some of the problems of redacting it back to an individual that possibly lived uh, in the seventh century. We don't even know. That we're going to get too much later. But now we're moving into another area that has not really been videoed. I've not seen this before. This be new material for you. Looking at how the Quran was put together, what were some of the stories that are there, looking at seeing that there are p biblical characters. We, those of us who are Christian, we know who these characters are. We know who Ibrahim is. We know who Cain and Abel were. We know who Sal uh, uh, Solomon is, and uh, certainly 
Issa, whether or not that's the right name or not. But they're not the same stories we see in the Bible. And there's an awful lot of differences. They're similar. And what Andy's going to do in the next episode, he's going to start unpacking it. This is for you to hear. This is for you to come back. We're going to start with this material. We're going to start unpacking it, looking and see what he actually found. 20% of the Quran is made up of this, these biblical characters, but they're much more than what we thought they were. Stay with us. This is great to have you, Andy. It's We're going to come here. back to episode number two. This is Jane Andy then here in London. Over and out. <laughs>